Welcome everybody to the Housing and Economic Development Committee meeting for August 25th. No, 26th, I'm sorry. Um, it's uh, good to see everybody here, the last meeting of August. Mike Sigler has asked to be excused. Um, and we do have a couple of changes to the agenda, but Katrina, there's no public comment. Okay, all right, thank you. Changes are on your desk. We have um, two resolutions that are related to the Chamber Foundation's microenterprise grant. And uh, one is the making a neg negative declaration of environmental significance. And the other is delegating to the grant review committee the power to conduct environmental reviews. So with apologies that we didn't get to send this to you earlier, but I hope it's, they're not controversial. Could I get a motion to uh, add these to the agenda? Moved by Shauna, second by Annie. Uh, and all in favor of adding, that's unanimous. Thank you. We would put that <clears throat> together with under 11 uh, with the Chamber of Commerce related to that grant. So thank you very much. Um, can we get a uh, <clears throat> motion on the minutes from July 22nd? Moved by Shauna, seconded by Henry. Second by Henry, we'll let Henry do it. <laughs> With Michelle, it's compliments to Michelle for doing a, a comprehensive job on the minutes. Uh, any suggestions or changes? Uh, all in favor then of the minutes. That's unanimous. Thank you. Well, we're moving right along. Um, the uh, county administration, my understanding is that they didn't have any particular report, but I just want to see. I see Lisa's on the call, Amy's on the call. If there's anything you'd like to to raise and update us on about committee business or anything else. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I can I can give just a, the briefest of updates, um, just hitting on a, a couple of key areas um, in terms of uh, COVID. Our EOS, the county's emergency operations center, is back into full full swing, um, seeing you know active cases of COVID. Um, and our health department is um, still holding um, upcoming pop-up clinics, but we'll be tapering off of that and doing focusing on um, the contact tracing and case investigations. Um, so at working with our um, higher educational institutions as students are returning into um, the area and um, working with schools as they are reopening in the fall. Um, we know that the, um, we are also finalizing the details of our, the county's mandatory vaccination and testing program. And what's um, important for the legislature to um, be aware of is that the federal declaration has been extended through December, allowing our testing to be reimbursable, at least through December. Um, so we continue to work on the, the, the details to operationalize our mandatory vaccination and testing program. And um, other than that, we are working on the finalizing the county budget for presentation um, to the legislature's expanded budget committee on September 14th. So. Thanks very much, Lisa. Appreciate the update. Uh, questions or comments from committee members? Annie. Thank you, Martha. So um, Lisa, I see our active cases keep going up just about every day and uh, with 32 new cases since yesterday and 186 active cases we're reporting. Uh, so uh, a couple of questions. One is, are we, or would it be up to the legislature or administration to, to possibly change for county employees instead of vaccination or testing mandatory now that the Pfizer has been uh, has had a uh, final FDA approval. So has there been any talk on your end about mandating uh, vaccination for county employees? Well, we are proceeding with 
mandating vaccination um, as as laid out and passed by the legislature, which does involve, um, you know, mandating that all employees be vaccinated. Those that aren't must participate in testing. The health department, we're consulting with the health department in terms of the frequency of that testing and they're recommending twice weekly. Um, so we're, we're continuing along that path. Uh, we are also, we've heard from a number of our employees who are vaccinated um, that they may also be interested in uh, participating in uh, frequent testing because we know that the Delta variant does um, can be passed to by and to employees, uh, individuals who are vaccinated. So we're looking at opening that up uh, voluntarily to our employees who who choose to be tested who are vaccinated. So that's that's how we're proceeding. And does that answer your question? Uh, kind of, so would it be up to, my follow-up question, would it be up to the legislature? <coughs> if there was to be some change, would that come from us? That's correct. And, and I think that our guidance from legal continues to be to have that approach of having the option because there are people um, who, cannot be vaccinated for religious or uh, medical exemption reasons. Right, so we could, so we could mandate it though and allow an exemption, but right now it's, it's, test, it's vaccination or get tested. Yeah, and, and that's in line with the program that the state has rolled out as well. <clears throat> I think I think it's um, Annie. You're talking about a nuance that I've been thinking about too, in a sense that right now we're saying for no reason you don't have to give any reason to not be vaccinated as long as you go through the testing. It tightens up things quite a bit if you say you you have to be vaccinated if you don't have if, if there's not a. Um, a medical or religious exemption, which I have to think is probably a small number of people. Um, so I, I understand what you It seems that to go tighter than what the state is rolling out might be hard to, to enforce and hard to, to make that work. Um, I, I'm glad to hear that the testing is going to be reimbursable through December. It's also good to hear that the Health department is talking about twice a week testing because I think that's much more prudent than once a week. I would agree with that. Did you want to add anything else? No, that's it for now. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Uh, I'm, I'm interested in, um, in particular, in I, I guess I focus on corrections officers especially because you know nursing home staff are, are required now to be uh, vaccinated. Uh, I think correction staff are in the same position uh, of working with people who are living together. Do you have any update on, on uptake there of the vaccination? And, and, and also maybe surveillance testing too because of close quarters. Uh, I, I don't have the current breakdown by department uh, at my fingertips, um, I know you know we're we're looking at that, and certainly, um, anyone <clears throat> in any department, including corrections, that would not be vaccinated would would be required to do the twice weekly testing. Right, Henry. Well, Ray Bryant was at a meeting the other day, and he said that none of the um, none of the people in the prison tested positive. And they were being tested. Um, as, Henry, can you please wear your mask? Yes. Thank you. Um, so he said that nobody, he didn't talk about the correctional officers, but he at least talked about the, the people in the jail that no one tested positive. Okay. But he, didn't, but he did not discuss the correctional officers. Okay. I, and I, I'm not on the public safety committee, so maybe there's been more discussion there, but I, I think. Um, consistent with privacy that you know, we need to maintain in a public session. I, I really, I think that's a special case uh, and, and I hope we can look into that further for the officers because 
Inmates is one thing, but but we're putting people in close quarters, living quarters with our staff. And I would hate to see people be put at risk um, in this situation. Um, not fair, <laughs> among other yeah, among other challenges with incarceration. So um, all right. If there's uh, <clears throat> anything else. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for, for being here, for taking the time and, and for giving us these updates. It's a, it's, for the opportunity. it's a sad turn to be back to doing COVID updates, but it's, what we are, it's where we are. Um, I have uh, just a couple of quick things on um, the chair's report. Uh, the document that uh, Michelle emailed you this morning, along with the resolution additions, is just a uh, one pager from INHS. <clears throat> Member Johanna Anderson came to this last meeting and gave us an, a verbal update of where their projects were, what was in the pipeline, and a request for $2 million in flexible funding. Uh, at my request, she put it on paper for us. So um, this is a, a quick summary. Um, of what she told us at the last committee meeting. So I just wanted to make sure that you, you had that. And um, there's been more news lately about the Emergency Rental Assistance Program and why nationally it's, uh, it's been so slow to roll out. Um, and on NPR this morning, they talked about New York in particular, <laughs> that New York doesn't have any kind of paper application, doesn't have uh, an online application that works for mobile phones. If you don't have an email address, you're in trouble. Um, and you have to have, you still have to have, go through the whole application with something like eight different screens and uploading information at one sitting. So uh, I'm hoping the new governor will, uh, she has talked about making making this a priority. Henry? Yeah, I was going to mention the new governor mentioned this priority. And I know that New York has reported that 65% of the allotment has been doled out. My chip. Sorry, <laughs> what they said. They said 65% of the enrollment of the of the funding has been doled out already. But I'm not. Again, that's that's from OTDA or whatever. Yeah. Um, so, but again, the, but the government, the new government, did mention it specifically as item that she's going to work on. So. Hopefully that means something. Yeah, that, that's that's good. That would be great. I hope so. Um, and I know HHS continues to track this too. So um, any uh, so that's that's what I have. Any other any reports from committee members? I'm relevant. Okay. Thank you so much. Planning and sustainability. Welcome, um, Megan. I see. There you are. Hello, Megan. How are you? Good, thank you. Good morning. Um, I'll just mention from the last topic that anybody, uh, you know, tenants, landlords, people trying to help their neighbors, um, looking for assistance, applying for this, the rental assistance through New York State, um, locally, they're welcome to call 211. Uh, the 211 and the Human Services Coalition is helping. So if you don't have computer access, um, there is a local resource there for you. Thank you for that advertisement. I should have mentioned that. <laughs> Absolutely. 211 is doing a great job on our behalf. Yeah, we're, we're lucky to have them. Um, just a few notes because we've got plenty on your agenda today. I'll note that um, we are, our applications for our last open senior planner position are due September 9th. So hope to have some good news before too long. Um, I actually got to speak with Katie last night, so she's doing well, sent everyone her best, and fingers crossed we're hoping to see her back um, at work sometime after Labor Day. And uh, currently in the department, lots, lots flying, but we also have several staff members who previously trained last fall um, to help out with public health and contact tracing and such that are um, offering that assistance again to try to help manage things. And then finally, uh, our community celebrations grant deadline is September 10th. There's more information on our website. And I know there have been some workshops with video available too, if anybody um, is interested and wants to follow up. Thank you very much, Megan. Are, uh, are there any questions or comments from committee? All right, thank you very much. 
Um, we we do have a good amount of business. It's great to hear about Katie and send her send her our best. Please. Um, we do have a um, a few resolutions here. So um, the start to begin with Carpenter Park. Um, if you want to introduce us, Megan. Or, or Susan, I see Susan. Actually, we've got Susan on the line, yes. Let's put Susan on. Hi, Susan. Hi. Um, so this is, we've got two resolutions ahead of you related to Carpenter Park. The first is a request for concurrence with uh, the city of Ithaca's negative declaration of seeker um, for a 42 affordable unit apartment complex. And then the second is the resolution to disperse funds. Um, the POC, uh, the Community Housing Development Fund Program Oversight Committee recommended a $300,000 award for this project and $200,000 of which would come from Tompkins County. And I'm happy to answer any more detailed questions about uh, this project. All right, thank you very much. How about we get the, uh, the next act resolution on the table? Henry moves, seconded by Annie. Um, on the Carpenter Park, I know they had their groundbreaking a um, month or so ago. Um, and so that's exciting that that's getting going. Not not for the affordable housing yet, right? That was just for the mixed use building. That's correct. Oh. What I've heard on the affordable housing is they're expecting groundbreaking sometime in September. Okay, great. Um, all right. And it was very interesting to read all these comments, Susan, in your memo on the the neg deck, and I appreciate, really appreciate the attention to detail. I had emailed Susan about what happens with these. Is there filed anywhere a corrected FEAF? And um, you said no, that our memo just goes along for the record. If you want to clarify, yeah, that's correct. Because the county is not the lead agency, there doesn't need to be a corrected memo on file. And a lot of these were relatively minor discrepancies, just a couple of bits of missing information or information that's clarified at another portion of the environmental assessment form. Um, so this will just stay on file with all of the documents um, on the for the legislature. And the city gets that, right? Uh, the city has not received this memo yet, and I'm not 100% sure on that. Megan, if you can help provide any clarification. Yeah, uh, we can share, um, I think, you know, in terms of their actions, you know, their actions have kind of already been taken, but does, um, but we can certainly share for their informational purposes. I, unless you think there'd be any ruffled feathers, I guess I would say it might be good to have it on the record with the city too. All right, uh, any questions on the EAF? And you may have noticed that you're, your committee packet, the paper packet, went from page 15 to 61. Michelle and I worked out, okay, what, what, if, what kind of paper do we need in your hands? And we decided that the that full FEAF was 44 pages, and we thought you could look at that online, and I hope people did. So that's why your, your page pagination jumped that way. So... Um, are we, are any other comments on the FEAF? Are we ready to vote on that? All right, all in favor, please raise your hand. All right, that is unanimous. Thank you very much. Uh, and then there's a disbursement resolution. Somebody wanna move that? Any moves, any seconds? Any discussion on this? Very exciting to see this happen. Uh, affordable housing down at the waterfront. It's gonna be a great neighborhood and a great place to be. So all in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you very much. That's unanimous, $200,000 to Carpenter Park. Well, it goes on to the legislature and uh, that's, that's a, good to see that coming coming through. Um, is there anything else on, on housing, Susan? Is there anything else you want to update us on? Um, nothing at this moment. We've got a lot of things kind of being talked about in get thought about at this moment. So hopefully we'll have some information for you all coming soon at the next meeting or okay. following that. Okay, wonderful. Thanks so much, appreciate it. And Scott Doyle, are you there? Hi, Scott. I am here, yes, hello, how are you? Good, I'm fine. We, um, Scott and I corresponded about um, Something I heard from John Guttridge, a developer and, and business owner in the city, about FEMA flood maps. And um, 
it just sounds like a pretty big issue that we ought to pay attention to in terms of what you know what what can happen with property values uh, in mostly in the city. So I thought, even though there's um, still information to come, I, I asked Scott to come here and give us a little heads up about what's going on. Yeah. So I. I thought what would be best is just to give you a, a you know five minute update on this. We're we're knee deep in our county resiliency and recovery planning work as this fits in some components of that. Most of all, this channels through of course the peak committee, and we'll be doing a lot more with them this fall. But there's a couple of interesting points that particularly from housing affordability, but also planning that we're going to want to really focus in on here in the next in the night really over the next year. So in terms of map updates, we've been talking about this for many, many years, but they are in fact coming, I'm assured from FEMA. Um, they are due as of correspondence with FEMA last week. We will see draft maps in late October. So these are updates from, of course, our we have half a century old flood maps in our, in our um, county. This will update that and identify and establish special flood hazard areas, which will likely change. I mean, for kind of ebb and flow, but I think you know it's it's just um, based on some initial discussion and not seeing anything yet. But there's some sense that that our areas, which we know commonly as the hundred-year floodplain or special flood hazard areas, is likely to grow. We'll see about that. So in in late. October will receive the draft maps and those usually take about a year to be formally finalized. Now, what that means is, of course, if you reside in these special flood hazard areas and you have, you know, there's a federal law that requires any mortgages that have federal or uh, uh, government backing must carry flood insurance. So I think we know many of those people now that, that carry flood insurance, but that may change. Um, we may see more people that require um, that, particularly with the changing um, sense of uh, flood events and that if that extent changes, we'll likely have more people that have mortgages that have to require that. So just as an example too, in terms of cost, um, you have to cover the full replacement cost for your, your house and the most you can get on that is typically 250,000. If you carry in flood insurance at a $250,000 house, that's an extra $4,000 a year of flood insurance payment. That's typically what it is average with no content coverage. So if you kind of lace that in, if you're already kind of thinking through um, your mortgage payment and lace that on top, you know, that's a considerable um, concern, particularly if you're not used to paying that. Um, so that was the second piece I wanted to bring up. The third piece is one of the things that we hear a lot about, you may be hearing about in the media, is this risk rating 2.0 program that basically FEMA is going about how it, uh, uh, the insurance rates, how they value those differently in a much more equitable and I think uh, uh, more detailed way. We had some initial analysis on this, and we'll certainly get a better sense as this gets closer. This will likely take effect this fall as well. It's likely to push more kind of insurance payment on kind of some higher users, in different uh, higher higher end properties in different parts of the country. Based on what we've seen in the sense so far here, it will do little to change kind of those rates locally. It looks like that that will likely be a reasonable shift and actually could be potentially better for us too. So the fourth point I want to just bring up about these changing rates, and we certainly don't know the extent of this, and we'll do some analysis of, hey, how many potentially more people might need to be carrying flood insurance as we get these maps out. But just want to give a sense to, in terms of what we can do about that. Well, the obvious first thing piece, once we get a better sense of where these risk areas are, we need to continue to avoid those areas. And we need to continue to uh, clarify that with local governments to avoid building in these spots, of course. But also we need to do kind of more proactive flood mitigation in those areas for people where houses are, of course, living there. There's a third thing I want to just bring up that we're doing some analysis as part of our resiliency planning work that'll be really interesting too. It's evaluation of a program called the Community Rating System. Now, this is a FEMA program that local governments, not counties in, in our um, state, 
local governments can enroll in, do particular things, documentation, particular flood mitigation, education awareness measures. And if they do that, they save um, across the board um, a certain percentage of uh, rates for people on carrying flood insurance throughout their entire municipality. Now, it's often starts off at about a 5% discount rate or something like that. And it goes up based on how much effort you do. It's not really utilized that much in New York. My sense is the reason for that is it's a pretty decent administrative lift to do this. Um, we do have communities throughout our region that do that, but they're not that many. As a part of our work, we're going to be working with the community to evaluate what that looks like and how that could be managed as a part of this program to get a sense if this makes sense for our area and what type of effort it would take place. So you're going to hear a lot more on this front, particularly when this meeting comes out in late October. But I think Martha's right to just flag this as something that's going to be a, something you want to certainly track on the housing affordability front to think about how flood insurance impacts our local development market. Happy to field any questions on that too. Thank you so much, Scott. Just as I, we just approved two hundred thousand dollars for Carpenter Park, which might be in the floodplain. Okay. Um, thank you very much for that update. This is really sure. important. Uh, committee members. Yeah. Thank you for that update. Just extrapolating out four thousand a year at, at three hundred and thirty-three dollars a month. Yeah. That adds to somebody's cost uh, for their mortgage and insurance. So anyway, I don't really have a question, just uh, astounded. Thank you. Yeah, it's definitely something. Absolutely. John? Hi, Scott. I was also wondering, is this going to change the way that we're building houses as far as materials? Um, are they going to be built on like pure foundations? Like, um, are we going to see an increase in the building of, of new homes? Yeah, so that's a good question. And that's certainly a more detailed question for kind of your local building officials. Um, but absolutely, if there's a, certainly, we hope to see less and less of this, you know, act, building activity in these areas. But those areas that are affected, even in close proximity to, um, have to be built a certain level above but, uh, base flood elevation. So what's really helpful on these new um, mapping resources is we get a much clearer picture of those elevations really by parcel. So we'll get a better sense of what, how those things need to be built and how high up they need to be built. But, you know, some communities certainly throughout the country too talk about kind of how buildings are built, what they require in terms of dry flood proofing, flood, uh, wet flood proofing to allow, you know, water to move in and out. But I think you're right at core, you will see, potentially in these regions, more elevated structures because they have to comply with those requirements to be higher than that base flood elevation. Thank you. Can I get anything? Um, Andy just pointed out to, this might be another reason for countywide code enforcement to, to talk about helping people understand uh, these kind of issues. Um, and by the way, I was, I was planning to mention that we, we will be looking at that next month. C.J. Randall, who from the town of Lansing, who brought this up uh, earlier this year, wasn't able to come today. So she uh, has it on her calendar for, for the September meeting. But um, I, Dave, are you, do you have your hand up, Dave McKenna, or just playing with your camera? <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks, Dave. Um, I, I want I want to point out this is I mean this is it's going to be a shock but it's it's really important that the country face the real issues of flood damage and fire damage and hurt you know all the rest of it as we you know grapple with climate change um, at in historically what has often happened is that um, communities are, are impacted by sudden, you know, flood map changes. A small, one particular local community will be re-rated after, after a disaster. They make a lot of noise. They get their senator to, to advocate for, you know, in, increases in the federal flood insurance program, et cetera, et cetera, FEMA, FEMA insurance. 
so the taxpayers end up shouldering the the burden. It's such a false um, solution because on <laughs> the big picture is we we have built in places that and in ways that that aren't sustainable. And as a as a society, we have to adjust. It's going to be really painful, especially because sort of like an earth with tectonic plates where we haven't had gradual movement, we're going to have sudden movement on, on, these, on these maps and these rates. Um, so it's, it's going to be hard, it's going to be painful, but um, it's the right thing to do. We've, we've, we've got to readjust, we've got to recalibrate um, our federal policies on this. And, and if anybody saw the, an article back in the fall by Abram Luskart, and it was published in the New York Times and, and ProPublica about, uh, mostly about fire risk and, um, and climate migration, um, that the federal fire insurance, you know, insurance on fire uh, disasters has really distorted um, people's willingness to live in dangerous places. And at a national level, we just have to bite the bullet on this. And uh, um, we'll, we'll work to see what we can do to make it as, as manageable as possible. But I think it's really important to, that the community, that FEMA is doing this. So. All right, anything else on this? All right, thanks very much, Scott. Really appreciate your coming and tracking this and being the expert we're, we're going to be leaning on about it for, uh, for some time. Yeah, I'm sure we'll talk more on this soon. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Scott. All right. We are uh, on now. I know why Dave is here. <laughs> uh, we're up to the broadband resolution uh, for the town of Newfield. And hi, Nick. Uh, Nick Helmel, do you want to join us? Can I get this motion on the floor? Moved by Shauna, seconded by Annie. Okay. Okay. Uh, resolution is on the floor. Hi, Nick. Hi, good morning. Do you want to give us a little um, introduction on this one? Yeah, absolutely. I'll give you the, I don't know, leave my camera off. Um, but uh, That's fine. hopefully. So uh, yeah, we, this is a resolution here uh, to expand uh, broadband internet service in the town of Newfield. Uh, this is a request for uh, $75,000 uh, to uh, uh, help uh, 180 households in the town of Newfield. Uh, a little bit of background on this, as you are familiar with, uh, uh, earlier this year, the department began uh, a study of, of broadband countywide with uh, Fujitsu and Southern Tier Network. And uh, following the first component of that study, the market assessment, uh, we, we paused the study and, and you know, took a step back and said, you know, we should really start looking at what our existing uh, internet service providers potentially can offer in terms of helping to expand to address the underserved pockets of uh, the county where we know there are, there are gaps. Um, so following up on that, uh, we had a, a outreach from Point Broadband, which is a, a company formerly known as Clarity Connect, um, and they um, uh, brought to us a proposal for a portion of the town of Newfield uh, to expand to approximately 180 households in the northeastern portion of the town. Uh, it's a fiber to the home solution. Uh, so this is, you know, very high speed internet with the potential to expand uh, in the future as technology requirements grow. Um, the remainder of the funds uh, for this expansion are coming from two sources, primarily uh, Point Broadband itself, uh, but also a small portion from the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund, um, which identified uh, a small portion of this area as eligible for that grant. Um, so roughly the, the county would be supporting approximately 25% of the total cost of this project uh, and an approximate cost of $416 per home. Um, so uh, I believe uh, we have, it looks like from my screen, we have uh, Chuck Bartosz from uh, Point Broadband here as well uh, to answer any other questions regarding the um, technology or uh, deployment. Um, uh, I will also mention in your resolution, um, you know, we did our, our legwork on Seeker for this in advance uh, to 
make sure that this was um, a type two. Um, hey, I'm sorry, you're breaking up. We heard you uh, actually, the speaker. So uh, happy to answer questions. Question. All right, we, we didn't hear oh. what you said about the speaker. Uh, just that this is a type two action. Uh, it's uh, there's actually a specific uh, classification for telecommunications uh, in the in our type two um, listing. Okay, thank you very much, um, Chuck. I, good to see you. You want to uh, give us a you know couple sentences on this project? Yeah, uh, I'd be happy to. I, I missed part of what Nick said because I got a call right in the middle of when he was uh, starting. Um, so, I'll, but I'll try to give a real brief uh, overview. Um, the total cost of doing this is two hundred ninety-five thousand. Uh, Ardoff provides about five thousand dollars, so it's not a whole lot. Uh, the uh, there's a, actually it turns out to be one hundred ninety unserved households in in this area. Um, the problem with the Fujitsu study is they just went to national databases, which are notoriously poor. Um, and in fact, a lot of these areas are claimed to have high-speed service because of uh, uh, satellite service, which everybody, nobody's got, uh, nobody's missing high-speed service if you count satellite. Um, so it's uh, kind of frustrating. Uh, we did a physical walkout uh, at the uh, encouragement of Mike Ellinger. Um, so we actually know exactly who does and who does not have service in the town of Newfield. So uh, this is strictly uh, to help people who don't have any service. And it's pretty much the only way they do it or get it. Um, and uh, as uh, Nick mentioned, uh, this is a, a technology called Active E, which means every single customer gets a dedicated fiber, which means it's essentially a forever technology. Um, it can never really be surpassed uh, with anything that's envisioned in the next 50 years. So uh, that's, that's uh, basically the plan. All right, thank you, Chuck. Questions from the committee? Henry. Yes, Nick, is this are these homes covered in the Fujitsu study? So yeah, the Fujitsu study identified um, this area as uh, underserved area in the in its study. Okay. Yeah, uh, if I if I could just Chuck uh, just to insert there, uh, a lot of these households were not identified in the Fujitsu study. Some were, but a lot of them were not identified, uh, which is uh, unfortunate. And that's one reason why we did that physical walkout. Yeah. So it, it, yeah, and that's it's absolutely accurate. And the the um, so in Fujitsu study, they looked at federal data sources, and the primary data source is the uh, FCC, and the FCC defines a underserved census block only if no address on that block is claimed as being served by any internet service provider. So um, a census block is uh, uh, you know sort of the think of a city block if if one home on that block is being has considered served by FCC it's a known limitation of FCC data um, and it's why uh, the physical walkout uh, to, to determine where service exists expansions are needed but um, that, and it's also a portion of this area is uh, eligible for the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund because an entire census block um, that had not been. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I can't I, I turn the camera. Can't tell you to turn your camera off because it's already off. Um, I, I, I could interpret for him because uh, I know okay. what he was talking about. Um, the uh, one of the problems with the data, the, the federal database is it's kind of a twofold thing. If a single household in a census block is claimed by any provider, then, that, then it doesn't qualify under the federal rules. Uh, that's right. the first. Thing. Second, uh, it's thought, whether it's true or not, I have no idea, but it's thought that providers oftentimes overclaim so that they don't have competitors nearby. Um, and so that ends up disqualifying a lot of people. Uh, one problem with this particular section is for whatever reason, 
it's being claimed as served. And that means it doesn't qualify for any state or federal uh, grants, um, which makes it very difficult. And there were only two small census blocks within this whole area of 190 households um, that the federal government said, oh, well, okay, those two don't have anybody. So it was uh, available for RDOF. But, and as Nick was saying there, that's the reason we did that physical walkout is to determine who actually does and doesn't have service. Because we don't care if somebody in the census block does, we care who doesn't have service. Yeah, that was gonna be my other question about the other grants, but you already answered it. Uh, Chuck, when you say physical, when you say walkout? We walked the actual roads and looked to see where, who actually could possibly have service from an existing provider, whether it was, uh, you know, Charter or us or somebody else, didn't matter who. Um, so the, uh, every household that, that has no access to broadband um, was listed in this. And by broadband, we mean uh, either fiber to the home or cable. Okay, thank you, Ann. I, um, I got a call a couple of days ago from Lee Hayfley, from the owner of Hayfley Connect, too, who said something similar to what Chuck is saying, that uh, he, he, he said he has offered, but he's uh, continuing to offer to go in certain areas and do the same thing as walk it or drive it, saying that they can actually see who has service by looking at the lines. And uh, so uh, I, I know the study is complete, right? But I mean, to, to get real data, I mean, I think that's what we need to have, uh, at least in my view, uh, I'm not, I haven't been intimately involved in this, but it sounds like this is what possibly we need is the providers who are willing to do this for us to, to walk those areas. Yep, exactly. So Nick, I'm a little confused and I'm, the whole broadband initiative was looking at Newfield and Danby and Caroline. If we do this for this section of Newfield, how does that affect the the other, you know, we, we were at, I mean, what I understood is that we were asking for proposals from a half a dozen local providers on how they would serve uh, you know, these three towns, the, the, full, the full number of underserved or unserved households. If we pull out this 180 um, number of houses, what happens to that initiative? Does that make it harder to bring somebody in to do the other homes? What happens there? I mean, yeah. I'm, a little, I'm a little reluctant to sort of do one piece of this without knowing where we are on the full set of homes. So where where we are hey, <laughs> yeah. I, I can answer this for you if, if his if his doesn't come through. Yeah, I'm afraid that, that would not be um, the, the right. best place to get this answer <laughs> from. But Megan, if you know the answer, or or go ahead, try Nick if you can. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Is it yeah. coming through? Okay. okay. So we've requested proposals from other uh, uh, I, I think the big question is here, is the big elephant is the, in the room, is how do we get to the remainder the of the underserved uh, portions? The, the, Nick, I tell you, Nick, I tell you what, we're having a hard time hearing you. Um, Nick, I'll, I'll try to um, explain and then please jump in if I get anything incorrect. But um, so all the internet service providers serving, already working in Tompkins County and serving the region, um, they were, they've been approached uh, with, you know, kind of the areas that have been identified from the study as underserved. And so, yes, um, in, the, in this case, um, Point Broadband has a short-term kind of opportunity. That was the time-sensitive nature. We're expecting to hear from other providers for other areas of the county 
hopefully um, in September and start figuring out which ones, you know, just based off the networks, where they're serving, where it would make sense for them to expand um, that serve different corners of the county so we can reach other pockets as well. And I think Chuck can probably speak to the kind of the time sensitive nature of this, this one opportunity that for, you know, a, a pretty low cost per household um, had arisen. And that's why we kind of fast tracked this, um, realizing that we think other, other parts of the underserved geography are likely to receive proposals from other service providers who are more serving those, those corners of the county. Right. Um, so, uh, Martha, I think that's Martha, right? <laughs> you got a mask on, so I'm not 100% sure, but yeah. it sounds like it. All right. Uh, so when a provider goes in, and basically these are network extensions. And so the only people who are going to serve an area are, are people who are already basically there in some sense. So that, so it's not like you're going to say, oh, in the county, we've got, you know, a thousand households. Do you want to make a bid on it? Because nobody will bid that way. Uh, because it's way too expensive. Um, and so, for example, in parts of Caroline, there's no way I'm going to do it because Hafley's right there. Uh, and Hafley would, would do that, not us. Uh, in this particular case, um, we have a, we've got crews in the area now, so we can do it less expensive, less expensively. Uh, and that's the time sensitive nature of this is we don't have the mobilization, mobilization costs that are actually pretty high generally to get crews uh, out to an area. Um, so because they're still there, we can actually use them uh, now. Uh, in, you know, in a few weeks, that won't be the case. And then, you know, I won't be able to do that. Uh, the, and the other thing is we've got a very strong drive uh, from a lot of people to try, for us to try and get this in before uh, school starts or roughly when school starts. Um, we've got a, a similar project in Dryden that we're doing where um, we're trying to get it in, in that case, uh, before school starts, because we may be able to finish it uh, by the end of next week, uh, or within a couple of weeks anyways. So, um, but th that's the main thing. The thrust of your question is, is there an advantage, as I understood it, is there an advantage to uh, proposing all of these areas to a provider? And the answer is no, because everybody's going to look at it as what's it going to be to extend to this area? Uh, what's it gonna to be to extend to that area? And it's gotta be adjacent. Um, the other thing is that there is an NTIA grant uh, that both Haithley and uh, we are partnering on uh, with uh, the Southern Tier Network, Southern Tier 8, um, to do other parts of Newfield, uh, Dryden, uh, uh, not Dryden, pardon me, Newfield, Caroline, and Danby. And uh, that actually covers a lot of the, the missing area. Um, the area we're talking about was not covered because of the reasons I mentioned before, which is uh, that it, the federal government doesn't consider it to be unserved, even though there is no service there. Uh, there's another large area in Newfield uh, that doesn't currently have service, um, but we've got the RDOF grant for that, so that will get served. Um, it just won't get served as quickly um, uh, because providers have roughly six years to build out in an RDOF area. So, uh, but does that answer your question though? And I'm giving it to you from a very neutral standpoint, just this is how we all approach it. Okay, Nick, do you have anything to add? Or did he go away? There he is. Do you have anything to add if you, if you can? <laughs> okay. Um, okay, I guess, Chuck, I, I'm, I'm still a little, I mean, you know that we, this committee can't approve it. You can't get legislature approved for September 7th at the earliest. Um, yes, we know that. Okay, and school starts, when does school start? So this is, you're not talking about being able to help before the be, beginning of school. Right, it'll be within a couple of weeks of that is all. So we're trying to get it as close as we can. Okay, uh, I guess I'm still like, if Hayley starts in Caroline and goes all the way across the three towns, those are adjacent. I, I'm, I'm not, Sure. Okay. Yeah. Megan? Um, I, I was just going to mention that um, we have provided information to finance as well, because this would be you know, a sole source situation. And so that has been approved. So if the legislature chooses to act on that, uh, you know, on this resolution, that part is squared away. I think recognizing the fact that we've got you know, one existing provider adjacent, you know, ready to provide this service with the county only paying a fraction of it. So 
So it, it, it's an option for you. And, you know, if you decide to proceed, I think between now, we, between now and September 7th, we can be working on draft contracts and things like that to try to roll as quickly as possible um, when, once um, full legislature approval was given. Thank you, Megan. Uh, Sean? Yeah, I am going to vote for this resolution. I think that it's really a step in the right direction. Newfield is one of the poorest uh, areas in our county, and uh, certainly it is a uh, school district of need. If this is one step that we can take to uh, help um, students get online, uh, constituents of Dave McKenna get online, um, then, then I think it's a great first step, and I'm, I'm willing to support that, as I would with Trumansburg or Dryden, um, and I hope that we would do that for each other. Just a second, Dave. No, it's not about not wanting to support it. My worry is that by chopping off one piece of the potential business, does that weaken the RFP responses we get from other providers to say, oh, well, you know, if I'm not going to include Newfield, then I'm not going to even, I might not even apply, whatever. So that's my worry. That's one reason we kind of do an open bid and see all responses at the same time and compare them to each other. This is cherry picking. I don't know. So I'm, I'll probably vote for it and then wait to get more information by September 7th. But um, Dave and then Henry. Yeah, Martha, thank you. Uh, I've been reached out to you by uh, Sonny Miller, who's a technology teacher in Newfield, uh, trying to find some way to get broadband extended to the unserved areas. Uh, I know the town has talked about it considerably. And I actually uh, referred people to Anna Kelly's uh, to see if she can help with it. Uh, I think this is a good thing, and to quote an old thing, uh, you can eat the elephant one bite at a time, okay? Uh, I don't think this is cherry-picking at all, even though it is my district, okay? It's just, uh, it's a big project, it's a lot of money, and it takes a lot of effort on these guys' parts. I know how much work Chuck did on it uh, before, and looks like he's in there again doing the same thing. So um, I support it. I hope you guys can. That's all. Thank you, Dave. Henry? Yes, Megan or Nick, should this proposal come under the, um, under the analysis that we were asking for providers to give us their reports or to, or to, or to bid on, um, on things this summer? Sorry, Henry, you said it. Is, is this is this area part of what we've asked other providers about as well? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, um, Nick, please <laughs> please interrupt if I'm incorrect because I, I will say I've come to this late with Katie and Nick away a bit, and I know Jonathan's also participated in this conversations. But um, I believe you know the the entire identified area, all of the identified areas in the county were shared with the providers, requesting you know information about which they might be willing to expand service to and, and what would be needed to kind of close the gap to make that actually happen. So this is, you know, kind of the, the first one out the gate, basically. And, and we know, you talked about September 7th, do we know when the other proposals will be in? There wasn't a set date, I think, like a deadline to respond, recognizing that we want to get all of the areas served um, and not set a deadline that, you know, people can't, don't meet, and then certain areas are left out. But I think, you know, we're expecting, you know, to hear back from providers in September, even if it's not a final, you know, we can do X, Y, and Z, it may be like, well, initially, we think we can do this, and then um, figure out like, how much of the unserved area we're actually covering from what we're hearing back from interested providers, um, to then figure out kind of the next steps uh, for, you know, where we go from here to try to make sure that whatever remaining gas we have, what options are there to get them service? And, and Nick is typing into the chat that, that yes, all the private providers were informed of the underserved areas. Okay, so, can I uh, share a screen? Is that possible? Uh, I think so, yeah. Katrina's saying yes, go ahead. All right. Okay. 
All right, so this is the area in Newfield that we're talking about uh, right here. And these are the, where the plan build would be. Um, I can turn on, uh, just use, well, okay, let me just show you that. Uh, the white uh, areas up here are Hayfley. The blue is Clarity or, or Point Broadband. Um, and the point I'm trying to uh, make here is that uh, a provider like Hayfley and me are not gonna intentionally overbuild ourselves because what's the point? So these customers are already being served. We're actually right there, which is why this is convenient for us and why it's so much cheaper. Uh, but once my crews go, it doesn't matter. It's gonna be back to costing quite a bit more. Uh, but Hayfley is up here in uh, uh, Enfield and he's also down in Southern uh, Newfield. And the reason though I didn't uh, go much, uh, don't have much of his uh, plant in uh, Tioga County um, and uh, uh, I forget which county is down here, but um, Hayfley is built down here. So the point is, is that this, we're in this area here. There's no advantage for him. There's nothing to connect to. The other places where Hayfley is, is uh, this green area here. So it's logical for him to do this area. And in fact, in the NTIA grant, he's doing that. Whereas Clarity is doing stuff over here uh, because we're already there. And uh, over in Caroline, uh, it's kind of a similar thing. We'll be doing some stuff in an NTIA grant uh, over in this area, whereas Hayfley is doing this area because it doesn't make sense for him. It's not cost-effective for him to try and build off over here um, and overbuild us. Um, and I wouldn't do the same thing. I simply would not even entertain coming down here because Hayfley is already down here. Uh, and it's not that we don't want to compete. It's that there is no... In rural areas, it is so difficult and so expensive to build out. It's why these people don't have service already is we can't afford it. And when you've got, you know, eight or 10 people per mile, typically you, uh, and even 18 or 20 people per mile, you can't afford to overbuild because there's not enough customers to pay operations. So that's the situation you've got here. Um, okay, and, Jonathan, yeah. can stay right there. You're saying that the blue area is what's, is what's proposed right now? No, the blue area is where our where we already have service. This is this area right here is what we're proposing to build, and uh -huh. and so uh, you know, Hayley goes to here. You have to overbuild us down to here to do it. But he also isn't. Uh, we're subsidized partially a little bit uh, by a grant in here, um, which makes it cheaper. Plus, we already have crews out in, in the area, which is why okay. it's all cheaper. Okay, we're, we're gonna have to move on. I, yes. I would um, uh, I would urge you to come to the September 7th meeting of the legislature where this would be on the, on the agenda. Sure. Um, and uh, I you know I still have a number of questions for Nick and, and we'll and to find to really see where the other ISPs are in terms of, of their proposals. And uh, uh, so I'll vote to move this forward and wait to decide you know, on, for, on September 7th. And, um, you know, I, I really, the idea here is to move all of the homes along. And so uh, I hope we can feel confident that this is the best way to go. Um, is Thanks. there anything else from other committee members? No. To vote, yeah, we've got on the floor. Um, ready to vote? Nope. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming, Chuck. All in favor of the resolution? All right, that, that's unanimous. Um, so we'll we'll have time to to learn more uh, from Nick and uh, and see where uh, the other proposers are. So thank you, Megan, for filling in. Nick, uh, we need broadband. Are you in Newfield, Nick? <laughs> so, anyway, I, I'm actually in Oregon. You're where? Oregon. Oh, You're in Oregon. Oregon. <laughs> well, there you go. That explains what, a lot. Okay. Thank you very, very much. All right. IAED. I, I saw Margaret Frank on here. We're here. Oh, and Chuck. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Good morning. Thing. You're tiny, and I know we're tiny too. Good to sort of see you. Hello. <laughs> Good to see you too. It's great. It's great to see you guys too. <laughs> bye bye. All right. Thanks, Chuck. Bye, Chuck. Um, all right. So, uh, Margaret and Chuck, we have the uh, report from IAD in our packet. 
and we have a bond resolution that the title takes half a page. So um, first on the IAD report, are there any questions from committee members? And what's in your packet? Okay, uh, Margaret or Chuck, is there anything you want to add? Uh, demo report. No need to, but if you, if you put something burdening. I, I think it's self-explanatory unless there were questions, but um, uh, we're hoping to get the, uh, the TCDC resolution addressed. Yes, absolutely. All right, so packet page 73. Can I get the, I'm not gonna read that title. Document 10337, can we get that on the uh, on the floor? Moved by Henry, seconded by uh, Annie. All right, this is, uh, comes out of the Tompkins County Development Corporation, which is a conduit for bond uh, financing for uh, nonprofits. And so Kendall has got its original financing through uh, TCDC, and this is for refinancing. And uh, you've got the whole application here so that you would see what the, you know, what's really involved and uh, that's in your packet. So uh, Chuck, is there anything you wanna add on that? I think it's self-explanatory. Again, you know, we are not, we do not uh, execute the bonds. We are the conduit. And it says no, no borrowing liability for Tompkins County. Correct. Uh, Right. Or the state, or the state. Right. All right, and this saves them. I think I saw something like sixty-three thousand dollars a year. So, um, any questions, Shauna? Hi, I have a few questions and um, a few concerns as well. Um, if you could look on packet page seventy-seven, um, at the bottom of the page, it says the nursing beds are certified for participation in the Medicare and Medicaid program. Um, can you tell me out of all the residents that are part of uh, that, that skilled nursing facility, how many are actually Medicare and Medicaid funded? I would not have that number. We can certainly uh, research it for you. Okay, that would be great. Um, my other concern, quite honestly, is that Kendall caters to a very high-end, uh, wealthy population. And uh, as soon as you walk in the door, there's little to none diversity in the, the facility. Um, and so I definitely have concerns around the diversity um, in this adult care facility. Um, can you tell me as well, um, are they a living wage employer? I do not know that. This is sort of just a resolution simply uh, pertains to um, seeking to get a lower interest rate and it has nothing to do with operations. I understand that. They are page, yep. page 85. Are you willing to pay a liberal wage as uh, defined by AFCU? And uh, yes, it's checked. Okay. You, see the, you see the salaries there. The lowest is 29,000. Uh, so yes. Okay. Yeah, if you could get back to me in regards to the Medicaid and Medicare. Certainly. Um, that would be important to me. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, are we ready to vote on it? Any other questions or comments? Uh, all in favor, please raise your hand. All right, that's unanimous. Um, thank you so much. Uh, enough pages on that one. Um, thank, you. thank you, Chuck and Margaret. I appreciate your being here. Welcome. Thank you. Okay. Take care. You too. Uh, and now on to the Chamber of Commerce. Got Jennifer. Hi, Jen. How are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you? Good. Good. All right. We're up to packet page, whatever it is. Um, I'll get there. Packet page. I think 98. we're on 98. 98. Does that sound page, right? Yeah, page 98 and the pages that we were we added. Um, at the beginning of this meeting. So can we get document 10338 onto the floor, except into this grant? Uh, moved by Annie, seconded by Henry, by Shauna, okay. All right, we've got the resolution on the floor. Or wait, Megan, should we do this in a different order? Yes, please. Um, if you wouldn't mind moving 10345 
first, that would give you the, the negative declaration to then move on to the, the next one. Okay, is that accepted as friendly? Is that what we're, we'll do with the next deck first. Okay, so, so moved. All right. Uh, uh, this is if, if we're changing the whole resolution, do we need to hold the one that we just put on the floor or just want to remove a procedure? Okay. Believe you're another one? You can pull the one that you just put on the floor. All right, go ahead and pull the first one. We pull the first one, All right. okay. And move the next deck. Okay, I'll put that one. Okay. Put that on the floor with with Sean. Okay. Second. okay. All right. Great. So um, this is this is pretty self-explanatory. Also, anything special we should know about this? I don't think so. Um, there's you know summary in the memo. I want to thank Megan for her help, and um, also Jonathan has been helpful in terms of just sort of making sure that we're following the right processes for both accepting the grant, but also the environmental review. Um, I think just worth noting is that because we don't know yet the nature of every single project that's gonna come through, um, you know, we're making the best um, environmental review recommendation that we can at this time. And should we encounter any projects that require additional review, um, we will you know, look at those on a case by case basis. Um, just so everyone, just to quickly revisit this, um, each of the, um, the project criteria is going to exempt construction by and large, and the, the funds are available for furniture, fixtures, equipment, inventory, and working capital. And so the type of projects we anticipate seeing um, likely should, I mean, they really should not have any negative environmental impacts. So um, just sort of want you to understand the thinking that went into um, the, the resolutions that are before you this morning. But we need to get through the environmental um, and also formally accept the grant so that we can really get this program going and begin to um, start the entrepreneurial training programs and, and support some microenterprise development throughout Tompkins County. So we're excited. Well, you've been working on this a long time, Jennifer. <laughs> um, the, the, the number of steps is like always just daunting. So thank you for, for staying with it. It's it's. Um, it's a big deal. We appreciate it. Any questions on the night deck from anybody? All right. Uh, all in favor of the night deck, 10345. That's unanimous. Thank you. The next one is the delegating to the Microenterprise Grant Review Committee the power to conduct environmental reviews and to make award decisions for specific project applications to the Tompkins County Microenterprise Program. So, somebody want to put that on the floor? Go ahead, Henry, Annie. Henry, Henry. All right, Henry first and Annie second. Um, so go ahead, Jennifer, you wanna, uh, oh, Megan, go ahead. Yeah, I, I was just gonna say, cause I think you just, if I heard correctly, you you moved and approved the neg deck. So if we could do the um, 10, 3, 3, 8, the acceptance, and then third, do the committee. That way you'll have accepted the grant before you set up the committee for it. That's a good idea. All right. but I was wondering, I really, Megan, really I'm glad that. you spoke up. <laughs> All right. Did you hear that, Katrina? We pulled that. We'll start again. Strong. We should just ask Megan what's next. All right. Now I'm just going to go in a minute because I'm going to look too incompetent. I'm sorry. But. All right, Henry, are you moving the right one then? Yes, I'm moving 1030, 1033A, acceptance of New York State Hall. Yes. All right. And seconded by whoever seconded. Okay. Accepting the grant. Yes, this is the fun part. Thank you, Megan. Um, Dave, you have, you've unmuted. Did you want to say something? No, I didn't have anything going on. Okay. All right. Great. Um, all right. Three hundred thousand dollars. We hope to get get this going. We think this is this is really a, a great initiative, specifically to the uh, rural areas of the county. Um, did you want to say anything else, Jennifer? Uh, not at this time, unless anyone has any questions. Several of you have been at many meetings where I've talked about this grant and we're supportive of the original resolutions to put the application together. So I really just, unless you have any questions, I think, um, think I'm ready to move forward. Okay, fantastic. Annie? I just want to say, as uh, Mark already said, the number of hoops and things to go through this, I think it's been about a, almost a year since you've been working on this. So I thank you for your diligence and helping the community in this way. Um, it certainly has been over a year at this point.
I just want to again mention without Megan's support at the planning department, particularly as you know, every county does things a little bit differently. And um, all those interfaces between us as the sub recipient and the county as the actual recipient are really important. Um, and we all need to be on the same page. So um, it certainly isn't just me. Um, and Megan has provided a tremendous amount of support as well. So I just want to be sure she's recognized. Thank you, Megan, also. Awesome. Great, great team, Mark. Really appreciate it. Um, and I would note, I think it must have been the HHS meeting or somewhere, um, you mentioned that the uh, one hope is that you might be able to get a few more family home daycare providers out in the more rural areas. This can help encourage somebody to set up a daycare home. So um, that's one possible uh, business. So. Absolutely. And um... Well, we can talk more about the committee in a minute, but we're definitely looking to have the expertise um, on the grant review committee that will help keep things, you know, moving in the right direction for uh, any of those types of businesses. All right. So the fall has more time in our schedule in a couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> Are we ready? I think to she deserves a break. Yes, yeah, she does. Uh, yeah. I'm ready to vote on 10338. All in favor. All right, that's unanimous. And now we have one of three, four, six. Is that right, Megan? <laughs> this is the one delegating to the Grant Review Committee. All right, uh, moved by. Moved by Henry, seconded by Annie. Okay, you guys are getting exercise on your arms today. Megan or Jennifer, you want to give us a summary on this one? Sure. So the this microenterprise program um, requires that we have a microenterprise grant review committee. Um, the Office of the Renewal has just some general criteria. Um, they want to see appropriate expertise in the committee. Um, you, some of you might recall, as we were even going through the grant application process, I actually began to frame out the committee, put a lot of asks out there, um, look to have representation from you know, multiple rural areas in the county have representation from um, like business leaders of colors, for example, um, which works with a lot of um, minority women owned businesses, but also micro enterprises. Um, I have uh, Jude from the Child Development Council, um, who works directly with small business uh, group family child care businesses. So uh, really trying to make sure we have the right set of expertise on the committee. Um, Chuck Schwerin from Ithaca Area Economic Development, who as you likely know, does a lot of the loan review um, and recommendations at Ithaca Area Economic Development um, will be on the committee as well. Um, and then Megan uh, from the planning department and myself, we have uh, made available to and suggested if there's a legislator who would like to serve on this committee, um, we certainly, um, it's an invitation and, and the ledge may decide that that makes sense to designate um, one of you to serve on this committee. Um, and then I just think it's important to, to understand what the resolution is doing is really giving most of the authority for approval to that committee um, recognizing that committee will need to consider the environmental and any projects that do need an extra level of environmental review. Um, and again, just mentioning that Megan's been working with Jonathan as a county attorney on this to ensure that um, the way this is set up is, is aligning with both um, the Office of Community Renewal requirements for the grant program, but also state law related to open meetings laws and um, you know the authority that this committee is allowed to have um, in the way that it's set up. So just based on trying to make sure the program flows as well as possible, that we have as few additional layers of um, approval oversight and as few meetings as possible to get someone through the process of application and then and ultimately approval. Um, this seemed to be the best way to set it up. Um, and Megan, if you have anything else you want to add, I would love to leave some space for you. Yeah, this is, this is just uh, in many ways similar to the home ownership committee the county had for many years when it had a CDBG funded home ownership program. Um, we always did have a legislator on that um, committee so that you had a kind of a direct tie back to the full legislature. Um, and essentially because the you know private uh, financial data that is, you know, shared for, in the application process and for decisions and things like that are, you know, essentially executive session sort of situations, um, you know, and talking with Jonathan will be very clear, both, you know, anything the chamber puts out as well as um, county web materials 
how the public, you know, is welcome to address this committee, you know, share their thoughts and concerns as well, recognizing that we can't, a lot of the actual um, work of the committee is going to need to be done in an executive session, um, but that the public should have an ability to um, share any questions, concerns, ideas, those sorts of things. That sounds great. And I see in the resolutions that the chair of the legislature uh, will appoint members of this committee. So I would invite any members here, if you're interested, to uh, to raise your hand to, to be on that committee. I was on the home ownership committee for a long time, and, and it's um it's really good to get to know like a program like that and to be to be part of that. So I uh, would recommend that. Um, and thank you again for Megan for, for all the work. Is there any chance? With all the work to set this up, is there any chance that this is like a recurring thing that that there could be another cycle that the chamber could apply? And so, um, kind of like the CDBG housing grants, that you know, once you've gotten one, it's easier to get the next one, that sort of thing. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I mean, so long as we all want to replenish um, the funding after the two-year period has ended. Um, and I think, I think they probably usually want you to wait until the, the cycle is complete and closed out before you would reapply for additional funds. But, um, we always had a, a microenterprise either loan or grant program running, um, in, in my prior role. And, um, you know, once the funds are expended, if we, you know, are successfully able to identify, um, enough applicants and meet the program requirements and it's all going well and the county and the chamber foundation want to continue working together. I definitely uh, could foresee, you know, so long as the funding is available that that we would want to apply for um, another, you know, $300,000 or 200, whatever the number is um, in, um, I guess it would be 2023 or 2024. Yeah, and I'll note that um, unlike the housing activities arm of CDBG, this one doesn't have set deadlines for applications, so it's a, a more open process. So um, if we spent down early or something like that, we could also um, have that conversation at whatever point with the state. So um, there's not, it's an open, open funding round, essentially. That's good. Okay. All right. Very good. Well, let's, let's get this money going, right? Uh, all right, anything else from the committee folks? Ready to vote. All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you very, very much, Jennifer. Um, this is, you know, exciting. Next step. <laughs> so Wonderful. Um, so I will likely be back next month to ask for you to formally um, appoint or recommend, unless, Megan, correct me if I'm wrong, are we going straight to the ledge with that? With the uh, No, th this will give Leslin the authority to go ahead on the recommendation oh, from the CDBG subrecipient, the Chamber Foundation, to do that. Beautiful. So. Sorry, I knew that. That's what I meant. <laughs> Well, if well, anyone there would like to serve on the committee, <clears throat> Annie, um, you know, just, just let me know. <laughs> I looked at her when I said that, yes. Uh, <laughs> all, right, all right, don't go away, Jennifer. Our next topic is tourism, and I don't see Nick. And um, if Megan, do you have any report from him? Or I could hand uh, the microphone back to Jennifer, but... Um, yeah, I, I would say there's no formal report. I think Nick was planning to bring more something more formal uh, next month, kind of doing the alternating months uh, cycle. And so I know he's you know staying tuned attuned to um, recent survey data and things about what's happening in tourism, you know, across the country, really. Um, and so I think we'll have you know more information to share as that goes on. Um, apart from, I know we've been fielding calls at the office for the community celebrations grant and that workshop was held and the workshop materials are available online as well. So. Okay, and so Nick is doing research on tourism in Oregon, is that what you meant? <laughs> he, he's actually uh, pitching in, although he's on vacation, yeah. <laughs> I think he's what? He's on vacation, but wanted to oh, pitch well. in for this meeting on the broadband piece. Well, that's sweet because it's two hours earlier there, so that's... Uh, very nice that he came on. Did you want to say something? Else? Oh yeah, and there was no FTPP PP meeting this month, so. Okay. Well, Jennifer, we've got uh, you know ten minutes. Do you have a few uh, words on what's going on with CDB or what having? Okay. Um, I, I can wait. Okay. 
Go ahead. Oh, yeah, I, I guess I was just going to say, so So it just happens that Peggy is also um, away this week, but I can tell you the CVB has been certainly rocking and rolling with, um, you know, promoting the area with improvements to our website with, um, you know, both creative campaigns for the coming season, but also looking forward to, you know, the winter and into 2022, um, a lot of planning um, happening. And certainly the additional support has allowed us, uh, you know, to fully staff our visitor centers. We've seen far more visitors year to date at the Taganic Visitor Center than we did in 2019. Um, you know, just forget 2020 altogether. We are higher than 2019, which is, um, you know, just reinforces that people feel safe here. They feel safe doing outdoor recreation activities um, and they love New York State parks. So, uh, so that's been very busy. Um, and, you know, we're just still in rebuilding mode. I will say, you know, the pervasive need and continuing concern from this industry is the workforce issues that everyone's having. Um, we all know that there are so many causes for these issues, but, um, you know, this is both a short term and a longer term concern area. Um, I'm sure many of you have noticed if you've, you know, tried to go out to eat or support our local businesses downtown, um, that operating hours are still reduced. Um, the restaurants are, are sharing who's open when and who's closed when so that each of them may be able to raise more business, more business on the days that they are open. Um, but the staffing shortage is, is pretty universal in that industry. Um, and I'll just say just more globally, people are hiring everywhere. It's not only this industry, but it, but it's a lot more noticeable to all of us, right? Like we don't walk in every day to most other types of businesses to figure out how many people are they missing or how hampered are their operations? It's really obvious in retail restaurant um, and, and, and that type of business. So, um, you know, I think we're just going to, we're, we're still having a lot of conversations in the economic recovery group meetings, um, the tourism recovery meetings about how we can creatively support that industry, how they can, you know, consider innovating and, and what opportunities to, to sort of do some longer term problem solving they will have because I, it's not just going to suddenly change in October. Um, so, so I'd, I'd say that's probably all I need to share unless anyone has any specific questions. I'm sure there'll be a, a more comprehensive tourism report next month. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. Annie? Um, so Jennifer, for your grant committee, unless there's somebody else here on this committee that really wants to do it, I think you've warned, I mean, I think you've piqued my interest that uh, Ooh. I, 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 I'd like to be involved. Well, it makes sense with your background, but you were also the legislator who was, I think, most interested in supporting this from, from day one. So certainly you'd be welcome on the committee, but I, you know, I wasn't expecting you to answer right now. Um, wanted to give you, wanted to give you an opportunity to say no. So, uh, but thank you for that. That's great. Well, since we have a city rep and a town rep and I'm leaving the legislature, Annie was the one, but, uh, but I'll tell you, you have express a lot of interest in this over the over the month so thank you Annie. that's great um any, anything else from other folks for jennifer well i'm glad to hear that the visitor centers are fully fully staffed you know that was uh you know our hope uh in, in moving money out uh, last month and um this the workforce issues it's it's really interesting are you saying that restaurants are kind of coordinating like if you're open Monday, I won't be open Monday. So that they're, you know, trying to stagger so that they're helping each other in a sense. It, it's quite apparent if you go down there on certain weekdays. Um, uh, you know, I, I can't I can't really speak to the level of coordination. I believe there is some communication. Um, if you if you were to go down to Restaurant Row, for example, on some weekdays, there are certain restaurants open and. And, and very full of customers, both indoors and outdoors, and others are closed on those days. And then you might go on a day and find other restaurants open. And so I think it's both responding to the staffing um, concerns, but also probably helping maximize revenues on the on the days that they are open as well. So um, you know, it makes it makes sense certainly. Um, you know, and 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 there, it's just been. I mean, for the last eighteen months, it's so many businesses. Have had to decide, you know, whether it was worth being open at so many different intervals, right? You need a certain volume of customers, a certain amount of actions to support the amount of inventory you have to keep and the amount of staff you have to have 
on at every one of those hours in order to even have your door open. And so, um, you know, I, I appreciate that people are being smart and, and making, you know, good operating decisions so that they can sustain in the long term. Absolutely. Um, and let me just, so uh, with somebody in the schools, uh, is it because New York schools open September 13th? Uh, the 9th or 10th. 9th or 10th. I, I, was, I thought I heard the 13th. That's so late. You know, Labor Day is late. And so um, that it feels like, okay, once school starts, people will be, you know, ready to, readier to, to apply for jobs. We still haven't seen that happen yet. So um, in other parts of the country, schools are already open, but here we're still, we still have a couple weeks to go. So, yeah, at, at, you know, and this is just my, my thinking on this. Um, so take it or leave it. But I think people expect a really immediate, uh, shift once school is open or once um, unemployment benefits, uh, the enhanced benefits go away, et cetera. Um, my theory is it's going to take a little bit longer uh, for a couple of different reasons. Number one, people don't like maybe immediately need to run out and start looking for a job. Um, a lot of people have been able to build up some additional savings. Um, and, you know, whether it was additional child tax credits, additional stimulus, additional unemployment, people maybe have a little bit more than they they've had prior um and it, it also takes like four to six weeks sometimes to get through a hiring process right to to actually get out there start applying or you need some time um and then and then the actual interview and hiring process can take quite a long time as you all know um and so i i think it's going to be late fall before any of those impacts are really clear whether we're seeing a big increase and it might even be into 2022 um, I just don't expect on September 21st, all of a sudden, you know, people are going to have a lot more staff walking in the door. It's going to take a little while. Right. So. right. Okay. Sean. I think also a lot of people are apprehensive to send their kids to school, knowing that unfortunately schools could be closing within two or three weeks or classrooms could be closing and their kids yeah. could be back home. Yeah. And it kind of sets them up for, you know, either being terminated or not being able to go to their job or take care of their kids. Yeah, I think that's yeah. a good point. And I, I think the mask mandate for New York is, is a level of comfort. I think it's going to make it a lot safer and less likely for, for us to have to go remote again. Well, the, the mask mandate plus the vaccine mandate and or testing requirements intensifying, I, you know, hopefully will give people some more comfort. But the best thing to give people comfort is to get our caseload back under control in this county. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know, yeah. I know your team is working hard on that, but, um, and, and I, I will say a thing I'm, I'm heartened to see, you know, I've been keeping track of the, the caseload at the colleges. It's not the college students and it's not the staff at the colleges that, that, that are the bulk of, of what we're seeing. Um, you know, and I haven't seen a lot of chatter in that regard in the community, but I think it's sometimes we're very quick to point fingers in those directions. And yeah. I, don't, I think that's what the data is showing right now. So, um, yeah, I hope we can hope we can all do our can, you know do all the things we know that work to to get this back under control. Yep, absolutely. I had just that conversation a couple of days ago. <laughs> That's right. All right. Um, thank you so much, Jennifer, for for being here and for for doing this grant work. This is really important, and we look forward to seeing some some fun results. Well, thank you all for your support, and thanks for this extra quality time with you all. Have a great day. <laughs> All righty. Take care. Take care. Thanks. Uh, all right. Let's see. I see Carol Cameron and Joe Mariana on in little black boxes there. Hi, Joe. How are you? Hello, Martha. How are you? Good. And Carol, are you there? Let's see. Um, well, Joe is on the Historical Commission, which is really great. He gets to sit around thinking about county uh, stuff, yeah. even at the retiring. So um, I wonder, Carol, can you hear us? You know, I, she's been had her name up there since the beginning of the meeting. Um, there we go. All right. Carol's unmuted. Are you, um, can we see a camera? I'm working on it. Okay. <laughs> Carol, you well, need to unmute your, your video. Um, I can't get it to look, uh, to, to undo itself. It's nice. It should be on a little box on the left. 
lower left. Uh huh. Hello, Carol. There you are. But although you're still muted. Katrina, are you trying to do? Trying to help her. I'm trying to help her, I think. Carol, your audio is muted now. Great. Thank you. Hi, Technology Carol. is not my thing. <laughs> Hello, welcome. And um, no, so don't touch anything now. You'll, we'll be good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so. Uh, welcome. We just wanted to uh, give you folks a little chance to tell us what's been going on. I know you have a lot, of, a lot of balls in the air, a lot of projects that you're working on, and we are delighted to have you share uh, share the latest with us today. We're delighted to be here because the Tompkins County Historical Commission is the most activist commission I have ever served on. So it's been a delight. What we're trying to do is to make everyone trip over history without, of course, suing the county about doing it. Um, we'd like to make history very prevalent and important and fun for the community. So in September, you will see signs going up along Cayuga Street written in the Cayuga language to rename the street or dual name the street. Um, so it will be called Gaiahono as well as Cayuga. And that's one of our projects. In addition, we have a pamphlet that we're working on now with Kurt Jordan at the American Indian Program at Cornell about the history of the Cayuga people. And so that will be coming out sometime before the end of this year. We have published three other pamphlets that I think we have gotten to everyone in the, um, on, the, on, the, on the legislature. And what we have done is develop a number of interesting new local historians, including Joe Mariani, um, who is going to bring out within the next couple of weeks, a book called Political Tompkins, about how Tompkins County has voted from 1828 to the present. And it's not what you think, so you'll need to read it. Um, in addition, we're trying to bring ways for us to, or discover ways for us to recognize those people who in our county's past have stepped out of societal bounds or religious ideas um, or political parties to further human rights. So we're looking for a way to honor the abolitionists and those who worked to help the, the, uh, the people coming out of slavery in the South. And we've got 26 names of people. We're not quite sure how we're gonna do that yet, but we will do it. We have erected nine signs around the county to honor those people who were working for suffrage in the early part of the 20th century. And we have a number of other ways in which we want to make our history and the population, the people who've been here um, prominent and known so that we can appreciate the past because we're part of the future and we're hoping that we will do some things that make a difference to the future. We are working on one big project and Joe is going to talk to you about that. Yeah and I, I'm going to go quickly through here because in a couple of weeks we will also be making a presentation to the full legislature that will explain this in greater detail than I will today. And, you know, I, I think we're going to make the presentation in mid-September because it seems like the legislature would just be at a loss if you don't get a PowerPoint from me during the middle of budget season. So we, we, we tried to time it to co coincide with all of that. Perfect. But the, uh, the project that Carol is, is talking about is, is, is really a centerpiece of what she has described in terms of what the, the commission is trying to do. Um, the commission itself had a really rich discussion about a year ago after the George Floyd tragedy um, about monuments and what monuments of the future should be and, and who we should be celebrating as we think about monuments in the future. And um, it, it was really a fascinating discussion. In fact, we YouTubed it. So if you ever want to see that, it's, it's actually pretty interesting to watch. But coinciding with that, um, 
we uh, have uh, been contacted by an individual who wishes to remain anonymous, who has made a very substantial contribution to design and place two statues uh, within Tompkins County. Um, the, uh, the, the statues that we're talking about, the, 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 actually the, the money that's been committed um, by the donor has a few strings attached to it. Um, the statues uh, must be sculpted by a nationally recognized artist because the donor is interested in, in, in the beauty of the community, but also in these works of art being draws for people, contributing uh, a bit at least to, to the tourism effort. Um, they need to reflect the progressive values of our community. Carol talked about civil rights. They need to reflect the progressive values. They need to honor those who have been marginalized, who have been under-recognized and under-represented as, as monuments have been developed in this country. And to celebrate people who, is, who have spent at least a part of their lives um, in Ithaca. And with that, a tremendous amount of momentum has already occurred. We, have, uh, we are working with an artist who in fact is nationally renowned. Her name is Meredith Bergman. She has a major piece in Central Park and other pieces throughout the country, including the US Capitol, Boston and so forth. She is a renowned artist. Um, we are working- What's her name again, Joe? Meredith Bergman. She is Boston based. Thank um, you. We are, we are um, working with INHS for INHS not only to be a host of these statues, to give us a place to, to put the statues, but actually to be the owner of the statues. Um, so the donation of the, of the works of art would be to INHS. Um, and we have, uh, we've had great discussions with them about that relationship. Uh, we've involved the artists in those, those uh, conversations. And so we're moving uh, with good progress uh, with, with INHS on that. We believe the statues can be erected within the next three years. So we've got a good timeline. And we've begun to identify subjects. The first one has, has actually been identified by the commission um, and it would be Frances Perkins, who many of you would know as the first woman to serve as a U.S. cabinet secretary. She was the architect of FDR's safety net programs of social security and the minimum wage and a number of the programs that are currently administered by, administered by Tompkins County were the works of Frances Perkins, who spent the last years of her life in Ithaca teaching at Cornell. So we've identified uh, one subject of the statue. The second, though, um, the donor and the commission would like to represent the community of color. And so rather than identifying who that subject would be, we'd rather ask than tell. And we were beginning conversations with the community of color, beginning with the community leaders of color, to talk about who appropriate subjects of that second statue might be. And so the project is pretty well long. Placements are, are fairly well identified. One uh, would go uh, in front of Breckenridge Place uh, on, on that INHS location. The second would go um, at INHS uh, headquarters on uh, Clinton and is it Geneva, Carol? Yeah. So the locations are pretty well established and look at the, the artist agrees it'd be perfect locations for the works that she is contemplating. So again, we will provide you with additional details at the full legislature meeting in, in mid-September, but did want to begin making you aware of what, what uh, looks to be a major um, initiative that will be occurring here over the next few years. Joe, that is, that's really exciting, Joe and Carol, and um, 
I, I, I did have a little heads up earlier from Carol. This is, this is really, it gets better and better the more I hear about it. So um, this is gonna be uh, really, I'm sure it will be a tourist draw and, and just part of the uh, really special uh, nature of our community. So thank you for that collaborative work and, and, and the, the vision to make this happen. This is fantastic. Um, any questions or comments from, from committee members? I, Carol, on the suffrage signs, um, do you have a, a, a list or do you have pictures of them or you know where they are located and who the people are who are identified? I, I don't have a list um, right now, but if you go out the door of the courthouse facing DeWitt Park and then look at the Baptist Church, you will see a white sign that honors uh, Ralph Jones, who was the minister there in the 1890s and 1910. And he was the person who gave uh, space for the New York State Women's Suffrage Association to meet twice in Ithaca. And that, that sign is there. There's another one on the Unitarian Church because Cyrus Heiser was also a supporter of women's suffrage. He said, why shouldn't women do the same thing as men? And he saw marriage as a, um, it should be a contract. Um, and he talked about all sorts of things that we are still talking about today. Uh, there will be four signs at Cornell, two at Sage College, because the two women who took over organization after Elizabeth Cady Stanton and um, Susan B. Anthony died, were uh, Harriet May Mills, who graduated from Cornell in 1879, and Isabel Howland, who graduated in 1881. And they became the leading people um, of, of the New York suffrage uh, movement. There also is a sign in Dryden for Libby Sweetland, who in 1898, I believe, ran for school commissioner and one uh, was the only Democrat to win with a, a Republican sweep of the, of the elections and served for a number of years as, as, as a spokesperson for both education and suffrage and temperance. And we saw the connection between temperance and suffrage uh, very strong um, and, and something that, that we hadn't expected, but, but our suffrage leaders were also temperance leaders. There's a sign on the Clinton House for um, one of our suffrage leaders. There's a sign on Beech Tree because it's where the home of somebody lived and I've forgotten her name. Joe, help me. <laughs> I forget. <laughs> There are nine of them up, and I've forgotten some of the names. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, there is also a little booklet that um, Marsha Lynch has prepared to, oh, I can actually find their names. Thank you. Um, sorry, Kaiser. Um, there is a sign on Breckenridge House for Juanita Breckenridge Bates. Uh, Lucy Hawkins Caw Calkins. Um, was a leader of the women's group and she's at Beech Tree where her house was. And um, Carrie Booten, there is a sign for her at the Clinton House. And she was a very important figure in both temperance and sufferance. So we're trying to make history visible and we'd like to do more things that put history uh, where people are. Well, thank you so much. And is that a uh, folder from Marsha? Is that kind of ready for distribution? The little pamphlet is Marsha. Yes, Marsha Lynch. Okay, if, if we as legislators at least could get copies, that would be wonderful. And I, You've already uh, gotten copies. Mike Lane brought copies over to everyone. Does that ring a bell? I don't remember <laughs> seeing that. I'll, I'll make sure you get more. Okay, and um, yeah, it would be something we, we'd really like to help promote. Uh, Annie? Thank you. Uh, so just one question I, th I thought of, of 
for uh, the project you're doing uh, for indigenous people's history in this area? Are, are you uh, in touch with the uh, Cuyahoga Nation or other groups of indigenous people locally? Uh, Kurt Jordan is the head of the American Indian program at Cornell and he is in touch with the Cayuga people and so is Ben Sandberg. And as the signs go up, you will begin to hear about a dedication service ceremony that we'd like to hold probably the first or second week in October. And indigenous people from the Gaiahono uh, tribe will be here and will um, lead, the, lead the dedication. So yes, we are in touch. Okay, great, yeah, that'd be, I, I, mean, I don't wanna put pressure, but that would be great if it could be close to Indigenous Peoples Day, which I think is the uh, October 12th, maybe? Yeah, I think it is the 12th. And um, we just haven't, we need to get the signs up and the city of Ithaca is supposed to be putting them up. And we just need them to get them up before we have the ceremony. Great, thank you very much. Sure, All right. thank you. This has been great. We really appreciate both of you being here and um, look forward to getting out around town and seeing all of your great work. Thank Thanks. you so very much. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Take care. Uh, I see the TCAT uh, logo there. I see Matt and Scott. Welcome Hello. to our meeting. All right. Thank you. Hi, Matt. Hi. And there's Scott. How are you? Hey, good. Thank you. Doing well. Good. Can I? Go ahead. All right, can I attempt to share my screen? That would be great. You bet. Okay. Let's see. Can people see that? Yes. Very good. Good. Shall I just launch into this, or does anything need to be said beforehand? No, sure. Go ahead. Let me just ask, Katrina, is it possible for you to make the screen on the right with the participants any smaller so we can see more of the... Okay, good. Thank you. All right. What Katrina has done is I like now can't see any participants on the screen. So if somebody is raising their hand, just shout out You know when we get to, to questions. So, all right. Go ahead, Matt. Thanks. So, um... I'm going to talk about the transit development plan um, that's still in progress here at TCAT. Um, before I do, I just, well, let's see if I can switch to the next slide. There we go. Uh, just a couple updates. Um, TCAT continues to adhere to strict pandemic safety practices, um, masks on buses, uh, cleaning of buses. We have uh, like a lot of other New York transportation agencies um, gotten rid of the artificially reduced capacity on, on the buses. So we're starting to see more people on buses. Um, basically, over the course of spring semester in 2021, ridership was about a third of what it had been pre-COVID. Um, but I just pasted this graph in because I think it shows kind of where we're headed. Um, if you look over to the right, uh, th this includes ridership from Monday and Tuesday of this week. And you can see that it's, you know, basically almost double of where it had been um, all of 2021. So um, we expected with, you know, the uh, Cornell and other local colleges um, requiring vaccinations and really focusing on having um, in-class, on-campus uh, uh, classes that we may get a bump in ridership. And it, that seems to be occurring with the little data that we have from, from fall service so far. Um, okay, next slide. So with the transit development plan, um, basically this is a kind of, um, you know, several years ago, we did a strategic plan that looked at the entire organization um, and kind of set us on a, on a global path. The transit development plan really is focused on the uh, uh, fixed route network and other transportation services that TCAT provides. Um, so it's looking at the each route um, kind of in isolation, but also how they work together as a system. 
Um, a couple of the things that we're trying to accomplish with the TDP would be to streamline routes, try to keep an eye on operational efficiency. Um, in other words, you know, we want to have that bus in useful revenue service um, to the maximal extent possible, make sure that overall uh, speeds of the different routes, like, you know, the, the average speeds don't get too low. Um, at the same time, we want to make sure that we are receptive and incorporate um, uh, uh, feedback and comments from the general public. But we also had a uh, transit advisory committee, which included planners and, and transportation professionals from all of our uh, local stakeholders. Um, that group uh, has met four times over the course of the, of the planning process. Um, we also, you know, want to ensure that uh, transportation options for vulnerable communities throughout Tompkins County are taken into consideration in the plan. Um, and a couple other things here at the bottom. Uh, we, you know, one of the things we noted is that we have a couple routes that really have um, ridership that kind of is far beyond most other routes. And this is a particularly true with our Route 30. And it seemed like a good basis with which to kind of create an enhanced bus corridor. Um, and, and by that, I mean, you know, we, I guess in Tompkins County in the Ithaca area, going to, towards something like a bus rapid transit where you have separated bus lanes um, and a whole bunch of infrastructure improvements seemed unlikely. There's just not a lot of real estate on, on local roads to do something like that. But the idea would be to try to get as close as we can. So we would focus on uh, making sure bus service along this enhanced corridor uh, were efficient, make sure that there's good signage, that people are clear that if they get to this corridor, they can expect you know, 15 or minute better service all week long. So there was a focus on kind of establishing uh, what that corridor would be. And then you know, ultimately, um, there has been in the last five years in particular, just a lot of conversation about kind of different modes of um, shared transportation services uh, from, from you know, micro transit, um, different types of on-demand service. So we wanted to consider that as well. Um, we do think that fixed route service will kind of provide the bulk of our service going forward, but we wanted to be open to other de service delivery models as well. And over on the right, I don't need to go through all this, but basically, you know, this is kind of the second part of the planning process and we're nearing the end now. Um, basically the consultants that we're working with, Sam Schwartz out of New York City, they are writing up the final uh, TDP plan um, as we speak. So, I don't think we need to go through all of these route details, but I have a couple slides here just to show you kind of what we have been looking at uh, in the process. Um, we have been working with Cornell Transportation to kind of look at the campus routes, um, making sure they're clear, um, trying to serve different parts of campus um, and, and set kind of a minimal service level. Um, service needs change from, you know, daytime weekdays to weekends to nights. And so the routes also kind of have to reflect that. Um, the urban routes, a couple notable changes. One is that the Route 30 really becomes our enhanced um, trunk route for the system. And the plan is when, you know, when we feel ready to do this, would be to not just run the 30 from, from downtowns, from the Commons Loop, uh, through College Town Cornell to the mall, but that it would continue towards the West End um, all the way you know, to Inlet Island, and then down um, Cherry Street behind Wegmans, and, and ultimately kind of down to Walmart. Uh, the reason is, is because you know, we feel like there's a, I guess the West End, the waterfront area is kind of a new focus for development. 
and we and there's already you know a big residential building that's almost complete um, on Cherry Street. Uh, this probably won't go into effect because there's a bridge that needs to be replaced on on Cecil Malone. Um, but this is what we're hoping will be kind of the enhanced bus corridor. Um, there is also a kind of an ongoing discussion really about how to best serve the flats. And in the plan, uh, there's a, a loop route, the Route 12, which will serve north side all the way up to the farmer's market. Um, it'll serve uh, part of the Route 13 corridor, the west end, um, south side and downtown. Uh, we are discussing whether, you know, this makes sense as, as a fixed route loop route, or, you know, would it be possible to do some kind of on-demand service? Um, so that's part of the ongoing discussion. And here's some more, uh, urban routes kind of zooming out a little bit. Um, rural routes for the most part remain unchanged. Um, you know, working with Cornell, they expressed that they didn't want to have every single route on every single trip come through campus. So um, we're starting to to plan it so that uh, rural routes go through campus only in the peak direction. Um, and we would kind of bypass campus in off peak direction. Um, the other thing is that the consultants did propose a cut to the 36 and 37, which are our Lansing routes that they wouldn't go to the far north park and rides basically beyond um, Lansing Town Hall. Um, you know, the des density of residential uh, is really low and we were getting um, pretty few riders on those trips. This is something that we'll have to have a public hearing over, though, because it represents a, a decrease in service to those areas. Um, so while it's proposed, it's definitely not all said and done yet. And then the other thing you can note here is that besides the routes, there's three on-demand um, areas. And I think this is a better slide that shows those. Um, the 77, the T-Connect service is something we're currently operating on weekends. And it covers all the way up to Lansing Town Hall and then kind of out towards Aetna. Um, you know, this is a relatively low density area, but kind of punctuated with larger housing developments. And um, we've seen over the past year that ridership on this on-demand pilot has slowly picked up. So in the TDP, they recommended that we continue to um, operate the service and, and, you know, using that service model and that we would add an on-demand service in the Dryden Groton area that could potentially reach all the way to McLean, which currently has zero uh, public transportation. Um, this is something that we're going to have to explore a, a little bit more, I think, and refine as we move forward. We would have to issue an RFP for uh, a technology vendor to support the on-demand service, and probably, you know, whatever platform it is would have some constraints on on the size of the service area, how many buses we would need. Um, how trips are scheduled and, and all those types of things. So the proposal here is to include those areas. And, and I think um, I, I would like to see that happen, but the details are still not entirely worked out. Um, I, this is a lot of text. I just threw the slide in because I wanted to, to show that we had received a fair amount of public comments um, and that you know, TCAT in, in conjunction with the with Sam Schwartz have worked to try to address these the best we can. Um, also, as part of the TDP, uh, some thoughts in terms of rebranding. We're trying to reduce the overall number of routes, um, and we'd like to envision some branding that provides visual cues as to, you know, what that service really is. Um, you know, when it operates or where it might go uh, geographically. So this isn't finalized, but it's kind of an example of what Sam Schwartz is working on. Um, and, the, and then finally, there's another component of the TDP, which is uh, looking at uh, uh, infrastructure in the field. And so one of the things that they're working on is a kind of uh, a, 
a bus stop typology. So we, we have, you know, bus stops in different contexts, um, downtown, on campus, areas where there's a lot of ridership would get a certain treatment often or probably, you know, pretty much always with a shelter. Um, good signage, we'd consider other things in the future, like real time information signs and that kind of thing. At lower ridership stops, there probably wouldn't be a shelter, but we would want to move ahead and try to get the five by eight um, ADA loading zone, um, kind of the landing pad uh, and good signage at, at all stops. Right now we have signage at all stops, but there are situations where that ADA uh, landing pad is not there for a variety of reasons. Um, we could talk about those if, if there's time. But the, the idea is to try to focus more on what is out um, in the field, in our network. Um, all of these improvements improve the user experience. They help improve visibility of our system. And ultimately, you know, we hope that it improves the, the operational efficiency too, because drivers know where to stop, people know where to get the bus, there's no running for buses and that type of thing. Um, this is a kind of a conceptual drawing that they drew up for community corners. This would be a lot of work. I don't know if this is really financially um, possible for us, but it does show that, you know, we're, we're putting some thought into those stops that really need a lot of work, especially where there's transfers occurring um, between routes that aren't either right on campus or downtown, which are kind of our main transfer areas. And finally, um, I just want to bring to the committee's attention uh, that we have started uh, a T-Connect pilot in the Dryden area um, a couple weeks ago. The ridership so far has been very little, and, it, and it's, uh, it's, it's a little bit unfortunate. We kind of have a new push to you know, reach out to local officials, make sure they're aware ask them about you know, channels where we can reach out to the public. Um, we have done a mailer to everyone in the service area. Um, and so we're really trying to, trying to take advantage of the fact that there's grant funding for this pilot and see what kind of a locally focused on-demand service um, could look like and, and if it can work. Um, Dryden is the largest village uh, in Tompkins County, so that's why we kind of thought it would be a good place to start. Um, so, you know, I want to bring it to the attention of this committee in case, you know, you can help us with outreach or you have suggestions as far as, you know, making this a well-used service. Um, the URL at the bottom of the screen is where you can kind of find out more. And with that, um, that's, that's the update. Are, are there any questions? All right. Um, Tyler, before you go off the screen, let's see if there are questions on the maps, which I, I'd had one. Thank you so much, Matt. This is, uh, this is great. Um, committee, any questions related to stuff that's on the screen? Um, I, I was interested in, let me find it. Um, you said the uh, Route 30, I guess, if you, if you go back to that, the map of the loop routes and all. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that so what you're saying is right now it goes from the mall through Cornell to downtown, and the proposal is to extend that to the West End and to like to the Wegmans area. Yes. But okay, and then back to the Commons. Is that so? It's really a loop, right? Well, it would turn around, and to the extent that we can, um, just you know, turn around and take the same path. Uh, in the opposite direction. Um, the consultants, I mean, I, this is good transport or transit um, planning practice is for something that is relatively high frequency. You want to try to establish a corridor um, and not have loops, uh, sorry, loops or, or kind of deviations to the extent possible. Um, a large, you know, in the Southwest area, we are running on private road and parking lots and that kind of thing. And that's going to be a challenge, but um, I think we are going to try to run it in both directions there. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, 
All right, we're running a little late. Can can folks stay a couple more minutes? Because this is this is really important. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, all right, why don't you go off the screen then? Thank you, Matt. Okay. Um, any other comments or questions? There's a lot of information here, and this is this is really great. Anything else, committee? I'm just glad to see the ridership is. Per perking back up. Did you say that was directly related to students? That was at the very beginning. Yeah, that spike we're seeing in the last few days is, you know, I'm hearing over the radio that there's actually full buses now on campus. Um, that may change a little bit as, you know, students start classes and, and kind of cement their, their regular um, patterns, travel patterns. Um, we have increased service for the fall. So we have, you know, more trips on the Route 10. Um, we made sure the 30 was 15 minutes all week long. Um, the campus routes have, definitely they have more service than they had over the summer. So we have tried to increase service to account for, you know, the influx of students and in, in the start of uh, in-person classes on Cornell and, and Ithaca College. Um, so we'll we'll see how that goes. We're still not to the service levels that we had in 2019, and you know part of that is we we wanted to be judicious and not and not spend too much money providing service if no one was going to ride it. I think our experience last fall and in the spring was that um, we thought more people were going to come back uh, than than really did, um, and so we had perhaps a little too much service out there, um, you know, compared to the demand, but in the fall that may be flipped on its head a little bit. Um, um, so we'll, we'll, we'll be monitoring the full bus situation and, you know, to the extent that we have uh, staffing available, we'll try to do backups, but right now the staffing situation is, is definitely challenging for TCAT as well. Um, Henry? Yes, thank you, Matt. Do you anticipate that there'll be um, more service at Cornell because of the North Campus, new North Campus buildings? Yeah, we have kept that in mind, and that's one of the reasons that um, I guess I don't have the map showing anymore, but one of the changes on the Route 30, instead of running it um, on Highland and then basically through Cayuga Heights, um, we've adjusted that route to run up Jessup Road um, and then on Pleasant Grove to Community Corners and the mall. Um, by, take, by moving the course of the 30, we can kind of use that to supplement the, the campus circulator routes and provide more service to North Campus. Um, so we definitely are aware of increase in, in number of students on North Campus. Um, it seems like there's, you know, what is it? The sophomore buildings aren't quite online yet. Um, so we'll, you know, we try to get updates from Cornell staff every once in a while. And, you know, we may have to adjust routes again when those new dorms come online. You know, when will um, 1030 be going to College Ave anytime soon? Oh boy. <laughs> I you know, I, I have to be honest, <laughs> College Ave has been, for the past like six years, every single summer it's torn up. Every single summer we deal with detours or rerouting. And then in fall, it's always a rush to see what's going to happen and whether we can put our routes back. Um, this year, it's not ready. So we have detours on a lot of our routes. And in fact, like the 10, we've just scheduled for the entire fall service peer, period to use Stewart Ave. Um, we will put the 30 and the 90 back on college when, col when College Ave opens. So um, there will be service on College Ave. It's just right now the roads really don't support that. Thank you. Yeah, no, I'm, I've been saying the detours have detours <laughs> in the city. Um, right about I'm, that. Uh, yeah, um, I don't remember what College Ave looks like anymore. The airport grant, can you give us an update on, on that project? I can. Uh, thank you for having me. 
Great to join. Um, I got a little bit of history to back it up first um, and some of what Matt talked about. Uh, during the course of 2019, uh, TCAT was at around 4 million riders and we were talking about the need to grow and moving to a, a new site near the airport. Um, and that all changed in 2020, of course, when ridership basically plummeted. And I think at one point in April of 2020, we were down about 96% from where we were pre-pandemic, just awful numbers. But like Matt said, we're slowly, slowly increasing. I think right now we're um, before this week, we were between 35 and 40 percent of the passengers we carried pre-pandemic, and, and it, it looks encouraging from what we're seeing this week. So, um, so we're still optimistic for several reasons, um, and part of its community support, part of its development of advanced technology, including electric buses. And like Matt talked about, we're thinking differently, looking to provide service with smaller vehicles, which gives us the potential to reach new customers. And, and, and Mac talked about the app-based uh, service in Dryden and Lansing in an attempt to reach residents that transit has ex traditionally uh, not been able to reach. So about four months ago, uh, Mike Hall called me. And I have to say that Mike has been one of uh, TCAT's biggest advocates over the past three or four years. We, we wish him the best in his retirement. Uh, Mike said, I've got a great opportunity. There's, a, there's an aviation grant and it's, it's for upstate airports and we'd like TCAT to be a part of this grant. And you know, Mike, he's always very optimistic. He's telling us that, you know, we really have an excellent chance to be awarded. Um, so the aviation capital uh, grant submission date is September 15th. So we've been working with Mike and Gene McFeeders and TCAT's portion of that grant is about $7 million. So I'll tell you a little bit about it. Um, the $7 million portion for the plan calls for a 7,500 square foot auxiliary transit e-bus garage with room to store and charge five TCAT buses and, and room to store and charge um, community charging as well. So training is a huge uh, component of this project, community-wide training. And we believe that training is critical with all of the new battery electric microgrid um, technology safety concerns that exist in the community and, and, and across, across the country. Uh, the structure is designed to have four offices, a reception area, a conference room, and a training and classroom training. And the plan includes CDL training and testing facility. We've talked about that quite a lot here in the, at the uh, legislature. And we will also, there will also be a community EV charging element available and, and it's right off of Route 13. So that's gonna be really, great for the community. So how does this help TCAT? Uh, we will have a place to store and charge buses if we need room. CDL training and testing site close by is great. We would have resiliency charging. If our power goes down, there's another option for charging our buses. Um, State-of-the-art training campus and an opportunity for partnerships. We've already been in discussion with BOCES and it makes sense for BOCES to pro provide some of the education here. And then of course, potentially one of the big things for us, if ridership does come back, which we hope and we believe it will, this is a stepping stone to move to a new location. So um, this grant, um, these options are supported by our board. And that's, I wanted to try to make it quick because we're running out of time. So that's what I did. And uh, I will take any questions that you have. All right, that's great. Appreciate that update, Scott. Go ahead, Sean. Hey, Scott, thanks for coming. And um, this is actually, I mean, I've heard about this a little, but we have not heard any details, many details about this. And um, personally, I am pretty gun shy about entering into any new grant opportunities, considering that um, our airport went way, way over budget. Um, and so I, I know you guys are trying to get this done fast, but um, I would not be comfortable with that. Um, I think we definitely, um, the legislature needs to be informed of every step and I don't feel like that's happened. Okay, this is, this is all pretty much uh, aviation airport related. So um, I, I would assume you've been in touch with Mike Hall and this is what my... Mike has not reported to the full legislature on this. Well, I support the F and I. I know that, um, right? Uh, 
I don't recall this. Not the details. This, this topic now. Okay, I mean, this is a, a huge, massive decision, and you're going to have to have buy-in from the legislature. And um, hearing it from you for the first time, um, and just in passing, I mean, we've got to do a better job of this because, like I said, we were not expecting to take on 13 million for the airport, um, and it was, you know, promised to us that most of it would be federal grants, and that that did not happen. So most of it was federal grants. So federal I will say, Martha, let me finish. I will say that most, most, many of us are, are very gun shy about entering into um, any future situations. We just want to have all of the information first. So I think that's. I was going to say thank you. I'm glad that uh, Martha invited me then here to uh, discuss this. So uh, we can certainly get that organized. Um, I think, I mean, T <laughs> the TCAT part, that's. Three, three separate partners, and you said the board is is um has, is supporting. Well, the board it. is very well aware of this. The county, Cornell, and the city members. Yes. You said the grant, the TCAP part is seven million. Do you know what the total proposal total is? Grant. I want to say it's well, it's a lot more than that. I mean, this is this is probably close to a tenth of what the grant is. Um, Probably closer to 100 million. 100 million for, the, for this project? I I I, I shouldn't say anything because I don't. I just know about our portion, and I'm hearing from you know Mike and Jean. So. Okay. All right. Well, it's just a small portion of the grant. Let's put it that way. All right. Um, let me. I, I will just say I, I think that. Um, one thing that we are hearing from the federal government is that you know infrastructure is like everybody's favorite thing and transit is certainly uh high on the list in in terms of the bill that was already passed and i think in terms of the bill that's that's now being uh the larger bill that's being developed and i think there are uh, there are going to be a lot of opportunities that that we you know haven't even considered yet but I think that um, it is it is time to, I mean, this is, if TCAP's ever going to expand, this is really the time to do it. Because otherwise, you know, this is, the train is leaving the station, as they say, uh, with federal and the federal infrastructure bill. So developing this proposal, I think, is, this is the time to develop it because it takes so long. If we just saw with Jennifer, just for a simple micro, Enterprise grant takes so long to get these things sort of developed and through, but I think it sounds certainly timely to figure out uh, a fuller presentation to the, whether it's to F and I or to the legislature. Um, so I'll talk about that with. Uh, I guess Mike is on vacation for the last couple of weeks, but um, I, I'll. I'll check in with you and maybe it's Roxanne and figure out if there's a, a time and a place to, to do that. So, uh, all right, do you have, are there, I mean, the grant is September 15th, so you must have, uh, you still have a few weeks to go, so there must be, um, you're not ready yet, the, the proposal isn't ready yet because you, the last couple of weeks, I'm sure things will get nailed down. Sure, Jean, Jean McPeters would know exactly where we are in it. Okay, so she lead, she's leading it now? Yeah. Okay, all right. I'll, I'll figure out, I'll check out with Jean and see what we can do. Sean? Yeah, I just, I did message Deb Dawson and she said that she knows nothing about this. Okay. So I, I think if we could get people in the same room and figure this out, um, and also administration needs to be fully involved in this as well. I mean, I feel like there have been sidebar conversations and I mean, obviously no decisions have been made, but but we we really need to be part of this process, Scott. Yeah, not, I, play, I, not putting the fault on you, Scott. But. I brought this to the entire board. I'm really not buying the, okay, I'm not gonna say anything else. It's, it's just been discussed with the entire board. Okay, all right. Um, so this, do you have anything in writing that you can share or is it, let me, I'll just go to Jean. That's I think Jean, 
Jean would be best. She's the one who sent okay. me the, the information that I just, just uh, relayed to everybody here. Okay. All right. Terrific. Thank you both very, very much. This is uh, really a lot of good information. And, uh, you know, I'm sorry it's been a while since you've been to our committee, but you've been working hard in the meantime. So good luck with the fall semester and glad to see the writers, the writerships going up. And uh, Matt, I'll get back to you about the Dryden uh, Village situation and see if there's some other ideas for, for getting the word out there. That would be fantastic. Much appreciated. Okay. You bet. All right. Thanks, Thanks so much. Okay. Um, All right, we do have two other quick pieces of business. We've got advisory board appointments to the Strategic Tourism Planning Board, Ken Jupiter and Alexis Zaharis Grimm. Can I get a, a motion for those? Moved by Henry, seconded by Annie. Any questions on these? All right, all in favor? That's unanimous, thank you. And now we have one final resolution to actually get rid of a board. Um, Where'd that go? Last of our many pages abolishing the Economic Development Loan Oversight Committee, back in 10263. Ah, Megan and Amy is still here. Is this um, something you'd want to talk about, Megan or Amy? I do not. I just wanted to go back to the last conversation after this, but go ahead, Megan, if you have something. Uh, not much information, just that uh, neither of these boards have been active in quite some time. And so um, kind of cleaning up the books and then you'll on a level have another committee with microenterprise. So just kind of making sure that we stay up to date with all of the groups that are actually active versus um, uh, making sure we kind of put an end to those that are no longer. Okay. And Amanda Champion uh, had a few go through peak the other day too. Similar boards yeah. that uh, part so it's part of cleaning up boards that are active. And and my understanding is this was a loan a loan program where the the capital the capitalized amount was sent over to T what well, was then TCAD to manage. Um, so that was not something that the county was directly involved in anymore. So it used to be relevant, but not anymore. Um, somebody move it to put on the floor. Henry moves, seconded by Annie. Uh, discussion, all in favor? That's unanimous, thank you very much. All right, thanks, Megan. Uh, Amy, go ahead, you want to, Annie, did you? Yeah. yeah, go ahead, Amy. All right, so I just wanted to give you a quick update. I messaged with Lisa. She's been uh, informed that on the next F&I meeting, which I think is next week, uh, Mike and Jean will be providing a write-up of the grant details. Uh, what we had last heard is there will be six projects planned in that grant, uh, totaling $25 million. Uh, so there should be more information coming uh, within the next week with that whole write-up. So I just wanted you to know that there is some of that. I think, I think we can continue to have further coordination on it. Um, and then our policy on grants is that uh, the legislature doesn't approve the grants, uh, the grant application, only the acceptance of the grants. So just to make sure that you're all aware of that as well. So I know that we, we don't have to approve it ahead of time. Right. We, we approve accepting the grant. Okay. But it's still a good thing to, to hear about it. Um, that's very helpful, uh, Amy. F and I meets on the 16th. Okay. September. Right. All right, okay. let me double check because they were planning to have something out prior to submitting it on the 15th and perhaps I'm not sure where that's going, but I'll, I'll double check with that. I do know we're expecting a write up in the next week. So we'll make sure that we get that to everyone. Okay, um, that's good. I mean, the full legislature is gonna be way busy with stuff um, as far as the presentation to the full legislature. Um, but maybe if people can really be, if it goes to F and I, people will be really encouraged, strongly encouraged to go participate in the F and I meeting. That that would, that would work. Okay. So, all right. Thanks very much, Amy. Please yeah, no need a special F and I before. Might need a special F and I before the legislative meeting. Possibly, I'm just putting it out there. Although, if the leg, the legislature doesn't have to approve it, the legislature doesn't have to take any action. No. So. But still getting some 
uh, or maybe or just somehow, or maybe presenting to the legislature that you know, I know there's probably a lot of things on there, but just to get some information. Sounds like we would like. Right, uh, Henry. Okay. All right. We will. Uh, we'll work that out. All right. Thank you so much. And Annie, you're still vice chair, F and I, right? No. Oh, okay. No, well, I don't. I don't. No, no. <laughs> no I, don't, I don't think so. Okay. All right. Well, uh, the chair of FNI is here. Not, so. right. All right. All right, Andy, thanks very much. Appreciate that update. We'll figure that one out too. Uh, is there any other business for the committee? All right. Oh, my God. Oh, geez. We were right on time. I'm sorry, but thank you all for staying long. Really, really appreciate it. Katrina and Michelle, I think, is monitoring from Aldi Etherland or whatever. Thank you for sticking with us longer. We really appreciate it. So, all right, with that, uh, ATD is adjourned.